I'd like to paint a picture of the beautiful power of femininity. Imagine this picture with me. There is a young man. He is at church. He is single, and he notices across the way a young lady, and he watches her for a few weeks and decides that there's something about her that he'd like to get to know further. He's nervous. He builds up the courage to ask her for a date and says, hey, would you like to go uh, after church and we'll walk down to a nearby ice cream shop. And she says yes. And so in walking to the ice cream shop, he walks uh, on the side closest to the road so as to provide that protective barrier. They get to the shop. They enjoy a wonderful time of talking about any number of things of which he discovers that she had hoped he would notice her. They talk about life and career and so forth and faith and then uh, decide to venture back to the church where they had left their cars. They're en route walking and they are confronted by two thugs. He puts his arm in front of her and aims to take on the two bad guys and is summarily knocked out cold. He awakens some time later to discover that both bad guys are there on the ground and the police are there putting them in cuffs. He comes to discover that he didn't know that this young woman was a third degree black belt in karate. And she decides, there's something about this guy that I want to get to know more. That is a picture, in many ways, of the strength of biblical femininity. Now, my aim this morning on Mother's Day is to talk about what real beauty is like. Who gets to decide what really is beautiful? Is it Calvin Klein and, and uh, Aeropostale? Or, uh, it, who gets to decide what beautiful is? Is it your father, your boyfriend, some man? Is it advertising? Who defines what's beautiful? True beauty, according to the Bible, is more than an outer veneer. It's more than an external shape. True beauty, according to the scriptures, is who you are on the inside radiating out and defining how you live. Now, it's my aim to talk about biblical femininity and beauty. In some ways, I feel a bit like I have climbed into the lion's cage, closed the door behind me, and dressed myself in stakes. It's a tad risky, if you might say. And I wondered earlier this week, why did I assign this topic to myself? Pastor David has girls. I should have given it to him. (laughs) But the more I studied, the more I lingered, the more I prayed, the more I became convinced that there there is a life-giving, hope-defining message for all women. And all men need to know that message as well. And so if for whatever reason, in whatever way, I say something that is unnecessarily offensive or just downright masculine stupid, remember we have chocolate-covered strawberries for you today. (laughs) I am no fool. So let's pray and ask God to speak. Father, we just sang that you are beautiful. You created beauty in all of its array not only in nature, but in the heart of a woman. 
and it's most beautiful. It's most amazing when the heart of a woman surrenders to you. And so we pray today, God, that you would give all of us ears, give all of us a heart to understand. Our culture is so askew, they're so adrift. We must get this right. And so I pray, God, that you would help me to be clear, help your word to be obvious, empower it through your spirit, and attach it to our hearts and our minds and the way we live. We pray this now in Christ's name. Amen. I encourage you to follow along on the sermon notes in your bulletin. There is such a misunderstanding about this topic. I wanted to, at the outset, kind of provide a definition of biblical femininity and what beauty really is in that context. I asked earlier, who gets to define beauty? And the short answer for those of us who are followers of Christ is that the creator who created it in the first place as a reflection of him, he defines femininity. And so this short uh, definition that I'm offering to you this morning is a synthesis of several chapters I read from a book called Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And it really is an excellent resource. I encourage you to review it. It's in our resource center if you want to explore further. So three phase of phrases to kind of shape this definition. The first one is that biblical femininity is a matter of the heart. Heartfelt beauty is where femininity begins. The reason an older woman who can have a wrinkly face can be absolutely stunning is because of a sweet spirit, an inner reality which shapes and defines everything about how she carries herself. Inner beauty is a matter of the heart. It's what you believe about yourself. It's how you talk to yourself. It's how you feel about the way God has created you. Inner beauty, inner beauty is powerful, secure, unshakable. It is magnetic and it is determined. Inner beauty starts in the heart. Second, the second phrase in my definition is that beautiful femininity is a willingness to nurture strength and leadership. Femininity, as we'll discover here in just a few minutes when we look at a couple of texts, femininity is shaped and defined in relationship. In particular, its power is in relationship to manhood. This is why dads are so profoundly important to young girls. Beautiful femininity has a willingness to nurture strength. It's not intimidated by strength or leadership. Beautiful femininity nurtures strength to thrive and, and, and to grow and to expand. It values being protected, even when it's third-degree black belt more capable. I think in many ways this is illustrated most clearly in motherhood when the raising of children, but that's not the only place that it Happens that mothers shape and cultivate and nurture a strength in their children and love to see them thrive and, and, and build a platform for them to succeed. Healthy, strong, secure women applaud success in others. Third part of my definition, beautiful, beautiful femininity is a willingness to nurture strength and leadership from worthy men. Now, this may be the trickiest part of the definition. Femininity truly is defined in relationship to manhood. Femininity comes to its full fruition in the way it relates to other men. Not just husbands, not just sons, but other men. Worthy men. And we shall see in just a moment that that's part of God's design. 
for the male-female relationship, what we call the complementarian relationship of how they get together. By the way, spoiler alert, next week, men, we're going to talk about biblical masculinity and what this worthy man element really looks like. So my definition involves a heartfelt reality, a desire to nurture strength and leadership in other people, especially worthy men. This can all be summarized by the reality that a woman is created in the image of God, distinct, unique. God created man and he created woman and he created them both to reflect his image. They are in his image, Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. To say that a woman is made in the image of God is to say that she reflects something about who God is. She reveals something about the nature and the character of God. God made a woman different from a man on purpose, something our culture right now is struggling to understand, really abandoning. The reason God created woman is because it was the first time in all of creation, all in the creation scenario, everything was good at the end of the first day, second day, third day. He got to the process where the man was created and he looked at it and he said, it's not good for the man to be alone. Let me create another image bearer who will complete him. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And so a woman was created in the image of God and in connection to, in that case, her husband. Women, when you look in the mirror, you should be able to see and say to yourself, I reflect the image of God. I'm an image bearer of my Father, the God over all creation. Now I want to talk a little bit about feminine power. God gave women power. And that power is an incredible, amazing power. Wars have been fought over your beauty. Murders have been committed. Stores have been robbed. All kinds of things have occurred in thirst for the beauty of a woman. It does not need to be like the chorus from that old 1970s Helen Reddy song. I am woman, hear me. Let's look at the power of femininity. 1 Timothy 2 talks about this inner beauty, outer beauty relationship. 1 Timothy 2, 9, likewise also, Paul's saying to Timothy, Uh, That women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, with gold or pearls or costly attire, but with that, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. The Apostle Paul is training Timothy, this young pastor protege, to uh, instruct the women in his congregation how to express their beauty that God has given to them, their power as a woman. And his instruction has interesting language if you linger over it. Modesty and self-control really are not pieces of apparel. They're an inner reality which expresses itself in outer apparel. Teach women, he says, to adorn themselves with modesty. Teach women to adorn themselves with self-control. These are inner realities that express themselves in an outward expression. To adorn yourself with modesty means that you carry yourself in such a way that you don't have to scream, notice me, like me. 
applaud me. I watch on Facebook some of the daughters of my friends who seem consumed at times with the selfie and the pursed lips and the seductive look. And there's just a, there's just a plea. Notice me. Somebody say I'm beautiful. But modesty says that inner craving is harnessed. It's bridled. It's tamed. It doesn't go away, but it becomes reserved for a particular person, a lifelong spouse. Modesty is used in the Bible both for men and women, just to be clear. And the word literally has this idea of being organized or ready or put together. Uh, Kind of the idea that you organize things so that they don't get noticed. They're in place. Dress yourselves, he says, with modesty and self-control. And then in the passage, Paul has a contrast and he offers two additional elements. With modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. This is a contrast that Paul is saying. He's saying you don't have to neglect outer wear, uh, attention, but not to the exclusion of inner godliness. The apparel of women who profess godliness is good works. What you wear is your faith in motion. Let me say it this way, maybe dangerously. If you spend more time in front of the mirror and neglect time with God, you're out of balance. If you don't have time to be with God because you spent time in front of the mirror, Something is askew. Adorn yourself with godliness and good works. Inner beauty is of inestimable value. A woman who adorns herself with good deeds is godly and modest. And that woman, if I can say in a spiritual kind of context, is smoking hot. Let me illustrate this with a reverse uh, example. Have you ever seen someone who was outwardly stunning, seemed to have it all together, uh, you know, was dressed to the T's and uh, looked really, really sharp, and then that person spoke or did something, and you went, oh, oh. You know what I mean? The ladies are all going, I know exactly what you mean, (laughs) girlfriend. What, What Paul is saying is the reverse of that. That when you speak and how you live, it creates the, it's it's magnetic. It is incredible to behold. Now let's wade just a little deeper. God has given women an incredible expression of his image in the life-giving, life-bearing reality of your womanhood. Women have the wonderful gift of bearing children, and this is unique to you. 1 Timothy, again, 5, 14, Paul says, So I would have younger widows marry bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. Again, he's instructing Timothy how to guide the women in his church. In particular, these are women whose husbands have died. They are widows. They're young widows. And in their day, it was not uncommon through any number of uh, realities that men could die an early death. And it was harsh if you were a single woman and a widow. And Paul says, encourage them to marry. And then this advice, encourage them to bear children, to manage their 
household. God gave you a womb. It's the most incredible thing. God created in you the abilities to carry and bear life. Imagine for a moment, what if God gave that ability to a man? (laughs) What would we be like? Somewhere along the way, truth be told, somehow having children, aiming to raise them and invest them and make that a call, somehow became a second-class status. And that's not true. It's a lie. Raising children is a wonderful expression of God's, God's wonderful gift to womanhood. You don't have to bear children to be a godly woman, but if you bear children, choose to raise them and invest in them and shape and and, and guide them to faith in Christ. There's no greater thing you could give yourself to. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. While childbirth is painful, especially that last month, the gift of bearing children is a wonderful expression of, of the image-shaping reality of God in your life. This is precisely wielding the power of God in your womanhood. Now, for those of you maybe here today who might be skeptical of Christianity and its definition, for lack of a better way to put it, for women, I want you to think about a couple of observations for a moment. As our culture, American culture, Western culture, has increasingly consciously pulled away from the biblical definition and reality of man and woman, that they're different. Do you know who has paid the worst price for that conscious drifting? It's been women. The paradox has been that that women who sought to use their power to gain equal footing maybe in the marketplace or something like that, which is not a bad thing, but as they unshackled from the guiding principles of God in your independence and, and seeking for equality, what has happened is a paradox of opposite proportion. Pornography, prostitution, sex trafficking have skyrocketed in the last 30 years. And rather than being less of an object, somehow in Western culture, you've become more of an object. Just look at advertising. Watch advertising. Watch how they use feminine beauty to sell anything and everything. While advocating for abortion, to be a woman's right to choose. What has happened is that little unborn girls are being aborted at a far more rapid rate. And so I propose to you, those of you who may be skeptical of this, is that the Judeo-Christian virtue that embraces the biblical beauty of femininity is the best, most secure, most flourishing way for women to thrive, to be safe, to be valued, to be equal. Now, one of the realities for biblical femininity is you have the privilege of uniquely equipping the next generation. Titus chapter 2 Verse 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slave to much wine. They're to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. This text is fascinating. Older women, it says, should do three things. They should be reverent. They should teach what is good. They should train younger women. Now, men, just for a second, just for a second, 
check out. I want to talk to, to the ladies for a moment. Paul tells Titus here to instruct old women, older women to teach the younger women how to love their husbands. It's not always easy. How to love their children. It's not always easy. We men think we're a piece of cake to love. The ladies who have made it through this journey are encouraged by Paul to Titus to say, teach the younger women. You can do it. You can make it. I know. I know he's boneheaded sometimes. Help him out. Invest. Shape. Persevere. The same thing with kids. And I think maybe one of the reasons that that the divorce rate in churches is where it's at today is because older women have lost this platform. They've stopped training younger women to endure, and they lose hope because it is hard. This is part of the power of feminine beauty. It shapes the next generation. It trains husbands to be upright and respectable. It bears the burden of birth and it lives for a greater reality. I'm suggesting to you that the church should be a place where femininity and beauty should be protected and thrive. A safe way, place for wounded women to be healed and to feel safe. A place for all girls and women to discover that God has given you incredible, incredible ability. We're the family of God. We're to nurture this within the family of God. And if we're ever going to shape and influence the culture and where God has planted us, it will be because we're an incubator of this kind of reality. Because wounded women are drawn to precisely what I'm defining. Be beautiful on the inside and radiate life change, which is the envy of your friends on the outside. Don't let somebody else's outer standards define how you think and feel about yourself. Become loving, patient, kind, gentle, peaceful, self-controlled. And as the Proverbs 31 um, image is declaring, a woman like that, her children will rise up and call her blessed, and her husband also will praise her. Man, we need to get this right. We need to get this right not just for the sake of the church, not just for the sake of our children, but for the very sake of our culture, which is utterly adrift right now. That's my message on biblical femininity. I want to close by reading the second half of Proverbs 31. Um, We're not going to sing a song So I think what I'd like to do is have you stand, if that's okay. And ladies, just look up here for a second real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. We honor you, we adore you, and we want to do everything we can to help you become the greatest gift that God wants you to be. I'm going to pick up on Proverbs 31 where I ended. Why don't you just close your eyes and listen. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household. 
for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. God, we thank you for the gift of womanhood, of beautiful, Christ-honoring femininity. And may it thrive and flourish here in our midst. And one day we pray in our community and in this land. God, we pray that on this day, you would challenge all of us to shape in our thinking and in our hearts this biblical definition of beauty. We pray that, God, so that, so that we would reflect you well and people would see that you're the creator of all beauty. And that when we live as you define, there's no greater joy. God, we love you. We honor you. And your design, we pray in Christ's name. Have a great day.